Greetings, everyone. This is the People-Centered Internet. It is the 19th of March. Delighted to have you with us. Our topic today is adaptiveness and resilience for the internet. And you know, we had uh, some folks who were talking about this in our PCI threaded discussion last week. Some of you participated in that or observed it, and we're delighted to uh, have this. So this is a it's, it's a theme topic as opposed to just an open mic. And uh, I have no particular opening remarks other than to say that uh, over the last 50 years, uh, it has, uh, the internet has proven to be remarkably adaptive and resilient. The question is, can it continue to do that? We should uh, open our uh, heads and hearts to uh, talking about that uh, today. So, um, Anybody have a particular uh, uh, pang uh, that uh, they'd like to uh, oh, share on sorry. this topic? So I, I as, as I usually do, um, when I don't have a volunteer, I call on people. So um, Doug, Hulin, uh, great to have you with us. Uh, you've uh, certainly looked at the uh, architecture of this, especially related to wireless uh, infrastructure. So what's your perspective on the uh, internet's adaptiveness and re resilience and what do you think is, is coming? Yeah, so, you know, when I look at, think of resilience, you know, like there's availability, you know, like when we were in the cellular systems, you know, we designed for four, four nines of availability, which I think was like a, you know, an hour outage, you know, or more, and then five nines of availability down to uh, 30 minutes of outage and then down to six, you know, it's like, okay, you know, how much outage can you experience, right? And, you know, we would shut down the cellular network for, you know, four or five hours to do upgrades at night and that kind of stuff, or even longer. And um, now, you know, that's not acceptable, right? That everything's has to be redundant um, because, you know, people rely on it, right? They're mission, mission critical systems. Um, you know, if, 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 as an FYI, your heart has about nine nines of availability, you know, so, you know, over a 80 year lifespan, you know, your, your heart uh, is, is available, uh, you know, 100% of the time. And if it goes out by, you know, um, one minute, then uh, you die, right? So, you know, the question is, is what's the availability of the internet? And if it goes out for a minute, uh, what happens to society if it goes out for an hour or 10 hours and so yeah. forth? So yeah, I, can I just, I, I just remember when a metaphor the, to that, yeah, the, there's, a, there's a metaphor that a friend of mine came up with, which is aorta, always on real time access. Yeah. So, yeah. so the, I mean, the, that, that, Connects well to your metaphor of a heart. Yeah, I also remember when Florida Power and Light redefined its, uh, you know, definition of what uptime was for its customers. Is that the transition had just taken place where people had, you know, regular clocks to digital clocks, and if you came home and all of your clocks were flashing because they lost, you know, power for longer than five seconds, right? that this became a real irritant, right, to their their customers. So it went from, uh, oh, no, you know, you, you didn't lose, you know, you didn't lose any of your stuff in the freezer, you know, everything's okay, to, boy, we better keep the power up so that people aren't calling us annoyed that they have to reset their clocks, right? And so that was a, that was a big deal, right? Right. Well, like in the heart, you know, where, you know, if your heart stops, you know, you have, you know, AEDs that you can shock it back into the system, right? And as long as you do that within two minutes and get the heart back going, you know, with one minute, I guess, um, then, you know, I guess things are working okay. So, you know, there's resiliency and uh, availability and, you know, when, you know, what's, what's acceptable, right? When does harm happen, right? You know, like if your heart yeah. stops, skips a beat, well, that's not a, it's, I guess, a bigger thing. Maybe Harvey can make a comment to that. But if it stops for over a minute, you know, that's a bad thing. Um, so from an internet perspective, you know, we keep relying more and more on the internet, right? So it, it, you know, we go from, yeah, we can have it down for four hours to having it down for 30 minutes. Now, you know, it's, it's unacceptable because there's mission critical systems going on. And, uh, you know, so, you know, how does it harm society? 
Um, you know, if the internet is the heartbeat of society, um, you know, what happens when, when it goes down. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate that. Gary, uh, glad to have you with us. You know, you have a, you know, you were with us uh, a while back talking about, um, you know, mission critical and, you know, at times when people need these systems in, you know, disasters or emergency situations. So what's your perspective as a, as an expert in that space? Well, you know, as Doug was saying, we depend so much on these information systems. So when the, uh, when the systems go down, it creates a huge, uh, you know, problem with providing access. We need to provide a variety of backup systems where we provide information across multiple different channels, as well as build in resilience to overcome any kinds of problems, especially with all, all the kinds of uh, hacking that's been going on lately. Uh, I really worry about, you know, uh, not having access to information in critical moments. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the central architecture, you know, of, you know, you know, connecting versus, you know, that there are architectures that allow devices, you know, to, you know, connect with each other to create their own mesh network, right? Um, you know, that, that's kind of a both and is instead of an either or, right? Is that, you know, you can, you know, create a different kind of resiliency by, you know, not just to, uh, relying on a single architecture, right? Or how, how do you see that, you know, in, uh, uh, maybe people need that right now in Haiti, right? Uh, yeah. as, because there's, you know, a lot of infrastructure that's going down as we speak. You know, a lot of it depends on the ability of the uh, people who need the information to mobilize the uh, technology effectively. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, not a high level of a, often a high level of a technical competence among the most at risk populations, the ones who need the information. And so that becomes a big issue. They need a lot of help and support uh, to keep everything up and going. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, maybe there's a, um, uh, way to pre-deploy that, you know, it's like in, in, in case of the uh, break glass, right? When you think about that. Uh, Bruce, I see you're you're on with us. Delighted to have you with us. Um, Good morning, did, you all. Did you come to the uh, table with a uh, perspective on the adaptiveness and resilience topic for the internet? No, but as I as I as I look at you know as I look at it, I think maybe we all ought to go back to CB radios. <laughs> okay, well that, that, that's a little bit um, uh, re reach in, in the past. Um, yeah, has anybody ever tried to connect you know the internet to CB radio? I know that we've done it with shortwave. Um, so oh, that's interesting. I don't, I don't know. I've there's not. there's an application called Zello that uh, is used in emergency situations that acts operates like exactly like CB over the internet IP protocol. Interesting. But, yeah, but, that, yeah. but wouldn't that yeah. require that this that the internet still be up and operational at yes, some sir. level? Yeah. Yes. But it, amazingly so when when hurricanes happen, dog rescue. Uh, resource allocations, those are invoked. Uh, take take a look at it. It's actually uh, very impressive that create emergency sub networks and, commu and community uh, ephemeral communities to re respond to uh, to crises. Yeah, that's uh, like so amateur radios, you know, that are still up, you know, that there's allocated spectrum to am these amateur ham radio operators mm -hmm. that have connectivity. Um, the interesting thing is now with, uh, you know, Starlink and other uh, satellite systems that are now being able to connect to your, your cell phone, um, some of resiliency point of view, uh, you know, we have the internet in the, in the space. Um, it's, it's a, a 5G advanced um, protocol um, and you call it next, uh, non-terrestrial non networks. And they only have about a thousandth the capacity of a tradition, you know, if you, if you had a cellular network in the city, um, a 5G, you have less capacity, but, you know, coverage is more important than capacity. 
Um, you know, and uh, first responders uh, here in the United States, they have a, a system called FirstNet um, that was built out uh, for more availability and redundancy. It came out because of, you know, 9-11 um, when, uh, you know, firefighters couldn't use their system um, and police officers. And the only system that was working was the IDEN um, network, um, Nextel IDEN network, um, just because the way it was designed. And so they said, hey, you know, we got to have a public network. It's a system that that cannot go down. Right. Um, and so and the government funded, I think, about 10 billion dollars and uh, to get that kick started. Mark, your hands up. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to probably leave at the top of the hour. But the the thing that occurs to me is this the idea of of uh, self reconfiguration. It's like brain plasticity. So our brains are configured so that if our eyes go down, uh, our sense of touch gets bigger and maybe takes over some of that thing. And I'm just thinking, as something goes down in one country, can it, can another country's system uh, or can the whole system reconfigure in ways that that will compensate for what we lose? Yeah. Perhaps. Uh, we, we certainly have that kind of redundancy in like, uh, you know, the launch systems for, you know, NASA rockets, you know, there are five systems they have to vote right before it can go. And then there are multiple redundancies, you know, on mission or on board. Uh, Harvey and Ben, I see your hands up. Harvey, you, then Ben. Yeah, all, all I was going to say is um, I love the topic. I love the concept, but I think we should, in healthcare, I want you to be mindful, like some of the, as, a, as creating apps or working in the field, you know, if the internet goes down and I'm dependent on the internet, it's not like, oh, I can't buy a stock, like depending what function is literally someone can die. And so the stakes are high. Um, so with that said, you know, I, obviously I'm really big on AI and I, to me, I think everything should be AI. So in my mind, uh, what comes to mind immediately would be to convert some of these things to a small uh, language model that can actually be without the internet and just introducing that concept that some things should go to, to that. Case in point, say we're in the Grand Canyon and say there's no one there that's a doctor or healthcare professional and someone unfortunately, let's just say, uh, is having a heart attack or something and you don't know what to do. If you have my, this is one of the things I've been trying to teach on. If you have a small, large, uh, small language model like on your Apple device that should be coming out in the fall, then in theory, you could put CPR, you could put uh, put it to the point where I can point my phone and it could walk somebody through how, how fast they're doing the CPR and it's all on the phone. There's no need for the internet. And so just, that's all I wanted to say. It's just yeah. kind of pushing that. That's where should we should be headed. Yeah. I mean, I noted, you know, my, my wife was in the hospital a couple of years back, how much time people who were visiting her uh, even in the you know uh, you know uh, intensive care, you know we're looking at one device and having to you know enter it into a screen someplace else, and you know, they said yeah we spend sixty percent of our time in front of a screen as opposed to you know patients. I said well isn't that Bluetooth enabled? You know can't it just trans? And they say yeah but IT won't let us turn it on because they don't trust right the uh, you know, the, the transmission and the latency, right? So we have to look at it and put it into the, the screen. Uh, and I went back and asked, I said, why don't you try it? Because the insurers won't let us. <laughs> and so mm. uh, it's it's very frustrating because you'd like, you know, to, you know, free people, you know, so that the devices can just kind of suck that information into the system and spend more time with patients. But, you know, it is what it is, all right? Um, Ben, I, yeah, I, I think to uh, to Harry's point is excellent about the res the resiliency associated with the downtimes, disconnects, and setting up a high tolerance for novel situations that have uh, safety conditions, an S an SLM available that will establish those activities are uh, are uh, imperative for high. Uh, high resilient life support uh, activities. I wanted to raise the the issue about we talk about the basic IP accessibility, but some some of the interesting elements are the the layered protocols on top of it. We've all been through JNet and other, other evolutions. I my first <clears throat> activities with the 
uh, with the internet in part, we're building gateway, the hardware and software gateways between the LANs, the local area networks, token ring and uh, ethernet nets and the imp uh, imps because uh, think about internet, uh, the net extensions too, not just the basic uh, protocols, uh, base protocol levels. And so the resiliency is the, uh, one of the key factors is the adapt uh, adaptability of the layered protocols on top that that serve elements. Imagine, oh, the internet wasn't planned for such a, a velocity and volume of video, uh, vi uh, video on the internet. And uh, and at the same time, as we all know, the VoIP came in and and dominated on the on the voice side, and wasn't necessarily a core part of an expectation. So a lot of it had to do with the quality of the layers on top that <clears throat> that tolerated uh, some of the adaptation that would not have been tolerated if you all went solely to the base level. Very good, Ben. Thanks for sharing that, Ron. Um, yeah, earlier someone uh, mentioned um, uh, the, the brain, and it reminded me that in 1979, my dissertation was about uh, left-right brain and uh, neuroplasticity. Um, uh, but um, the other thing that came to my mind when, when people were talking was that around 2012, um, the Red Hook Initiative in, in Brooklyn uh, after Hurricane Sandy uh, used uh, stuff that I think was developed by Sasha Meinrath and Commotion uh, Wireless so that the projects in Red Hook were connected to uh, the internet even when the electricity was still out and uh, nobody's cell phones were, were working because the cell towers you know, were completely uh, uh, overrun. Um, and... I also uh, was interested in cord cutters. So in 2013, I was down, and there's a video of, of me on, on my uh, uh, website um, of me showing uh, uh, teenagers how to build HD TV antennas with $3 worth of electrical parts and recycled coat hangers so that they could um, you know, just get the internet and New York City had about 55 public uh, uh, over-the-air television stations uh, at the time. So uh, multiple you know, backhauls are, are key. Um, a decentralized uh, internet is something I'm really interested in and looking forward to. Althea.net is uh, about to uh, launch uh, what's been under development for about six years now uh, the ability to do decentralized internet. Oh, and I hear my doorbell ringing. Uh, that's somebody who's coming to help me to do a dual boot on a PC, which I didn't realize was so complicated to do Windows at, and Linux. On a Mac, you can just press the option key to you know, boot from something else. And apparently on a PC, depending on what machine you buy, and I didn't know this because I've been a Mac person since forever, uh, depending on what machine you buy, it's a different key, and there's no place where you can go to see how to do the dual boot. Anyway, thank thank you so much for this, and I'm sorry I have to go now. Well, Ron, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Gary, your hand is up. Yeah, I really like the idea of the um, multi-channel uh, redundancy of having uh, information on a variety of different places automatically uh, we tend to think about this usually at, in, you're looking at very sophisticated technology, but I think that we need to think about also very simple, um, easily accessible uh, channels like radio. The CB was not a bad idea. I think that, you know, we, we smoke signals, you know, face-to-face uh, -face communication, hard copy, you know, I, I think the, the more different channels we have, uh, the more access there is. And it seems to me that each channel has its own unique um, uh, um, attributes that make it valuable in different ways, providing information in different ways. Um, and so I think that it's really a good idea to have information spread easily and, and, to, and to set that up ahead of time so it happens automatically. But I also think we need to look at the, uh, the different um, 
populations, the audiences that we want to provide information to, because different audiences have different preferred channels that they use, that they're comfortable with, that they like, that they have access to. And uh, and so I think we need to kind of uh, come up with strategies, especially in difficult situations, in crises, where we can kind of uh, uh, do a strategic dissemination of information across multiple channels that fit the different population and the situation and the information needs. Mm -hmm. 100%. Um, Suzanne, you uh, were the first person on this morning before we actually turned the recording on. Uh, you're, you're at a uh, gathering of uh, interesting humans in Boston. Uh, so any uh, thoughts about uh, the conversation that we're having here? Um, any connections you know, for what's happening right this week in, in your life? Yes, um, I'm at the EMEA conference, it's artificial intelligence for um, uh, AI, med medical information systems. And uh, we were going over today um, from the excellent presentation that Doug had provided yesterday, just about the regulatory burdens, right? For the physicians and how there really is no, you know, told him about the EU, what Doug spoke about. And um, actually I had a pretty good solution um, for uh, trying to get support, trying to get more people on the mayor project, right? Um, but it just every single day, it, it, more and more, um, I, we must have a decentralized space-based system um, that basically from uh, incoming ballistic missiles with uh, with unacceptable payloads on them um, to the individual that is hiking in the Grand Canyon and uh, could have that person's phone be a you know a, um, you know a defibrillator. <laughs> so uh, it, it, that technology exists, and so it's going is we're just going to need this help, right? Uh, and putting it in the hands of those people and communities that are predicting threats, seeing the threats, it has to be decentralized. It can't be where we're concerned, where we're going to be concerned about bots. You know, it has to be in a really safe space. And that isn't going to, I mean, we'll be linked up, of course, with Earth based systems, but uh, we're going to need space more and more in a closed loop system. It, it's just uh, inevitable. Very good. Well, th thanks for sharing that. Um, good luck with uh, everything that you learned this week and find good applications I'll for it, my friend. All right, I'll share. Thank you. All right, good. Uh, I see some uh, comments in uh, the uh, chat by Frank. Frank, uh, join us. Well, thanks. It was a flurry of very interesting topics with different individuals this last week. Uh, I noticed that the uh, cable to much of Asia, Asia, the undersea fiber cable was cut by the uh, militants uh, this past week, which kind of begs the issue of how vulnerable the global internet uh, is, is becoming. But what I wanted to mention is, uh, Vint had mentioned he's involved with risk. RISC, which is quantum computing, and Paul has and others have posted on that this week. I know nothing about it other than it promises million times uh, faster speeds at a fraction of the uh, power, and AI requires huge amounts of power, so low cost, a uh, million times faster quantum computing. Uh, would uh, would be a game changer. But it also kind of begs the issue of 50 years ago, the scientists were sharing information openly. And the idea was that the internet could involve citizens and libraries uh, to emulate that type of generous sharing, building knowledge. And Doug Engelbart's co-intelligence themes were fresh and brand new back then. Uh, what what I see just briefly is we're looking at uh, a political meltdown. We're looking at mental health crises. 
Uh, a lot of things are going sideways, even though the infrastructure is uh, is outstanding and lots of people are benefiting in lots of different ways. So my question is, and this has been my emphasis for 40 years, is what would social quantum computing look like on an international basis? We have May Lin and her T7 uh, essays uh, that basically presume or seem to presume to me, once everyone's connected, we're all going to be good people and it, the benefits will be exponential. But what we're, what we're seeing is that the tools like for deep fake videos are becoming so easy to use, anybody with bad intent can easily get them at low cost or free and do bad things with them. So the resilience of the internet uh, is really a big question. I get spam messages every day uh, people that seniors in particular that don't know how to watch for spam messages are being, you know, robbed at huge levels. And, uh, you know, just briefly, I'll close with Tribella. The last PCI call was fascinating to me in that they were saying for women and girls that are under threat, we need to build a, a closed community that can really focus on the positive. And that's what I was doing with bullet and board systems in rural communities without great success back when computers were intimidating and few people had them. Uh, and, uh, you know, Gary mentioned that we, we have people with very specific interests that need specific flows of relevant information, uh, not the least of which is in healthcare and uh, behavior, behavioral health is the main issue in Indian country, for example. It's what people are doing to themselves knowingly uh, that uh, is what needs to be countered. And that relates to the mental health uh, crises and so forth. So, you know, what is social quantum computing? Where is it in evidence at any level? And when we have a million times more powerful quantum computing plus AI, it kind of begs the question, what are we going to do about the bad actors? Is is that something that will be in any way manageable? And and I'll close with that. But, um, you know, that seems to be the social side of the, the benefits question with the internet in general. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Greatly appreciate that. So um, I see uh, Matthew, you're on camera. Uh, and I see Maris. Marissa, so uh, Matthew. Marisa. Marisa, I'm sorry. I, I I don't always get the pronunciation right until I, I ask. So thank you, Mark. I'm glad you know. Matthew, first you. Yeah, um, thanks all for the, the wonderful, interesting comments so far. Uh, when I think about adaptation and, and resilience, um, I think about just all the different ways in which things can go wrong. <laughs> Right? Like there's so many, so many forms of failure. <laughs> and some of them in particular contexts are completely inconsequential and and dire and catastrophic in others, right? So um that that's one piece that comes to mind. Uh, so I don't think that the approach that we're making use that I am and my you know colleagues are making use of is the only right thing, but there's some there's some usefulness coming out of uh, parties themselves um, holding on to the or storing the things that they have created, like having that capacity. So when you're authoring something, it's not just being held in somebody else's server somewhere over there. Like you have a copy as well. Um, and then there's and and then there's also problems with that whole peer to peer side of things as well, such as, hey, if a hurricane hits, you know, yeah, I might have my local stuff, but a lot of the information that I wanted was from other people who might have been local. And they're still they're still here, maybe, but that content is actually the backups are stored randomly across the world, potentially, right? Um, and so uh, in regard to countering things like, um, a hurricane's a little easier than an earthquake or something else that's that's more sudden, but 
uh, a loss of access to data that is critical for making sense in an environment, right? Like the building plans or, or whatever, that kind of stuff. Uh, the, hey, it seems something is up. Let me try to grab the relevant information. Or I'm trying to grab the things that are critical and have very local copies on a somewhat consistent basis. You know, that's a weekly kind of maintenance sort of thing that's on autopilot. I've thought a fair bit about those sorts of processes or protocols getting put in place um, so that when the shit hits the fan, <laughs> right, uh, you actually do have access to the the content that in the current internet architecture is probably on a server far away that you a, you have no ability to, to connect to. So I'll Thank leave it there for now. Thank you, Matt. Thanks. We really appreciate that. Um, Marissa, or, or uh, pronounce your name so I get it right. Hi, Kevin. It's Marisa, like Teresa. Marisa. Right? Okay, if you think you. of it as like any of the Latin pronunciations, Marisa, Marie. like thank Marie. You. Yeah, like Marie, like Marie with an S. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I, I was able to drop in. I don't get to do it very often. Um, but uh, I, my concerns, I mean, I'm the, some, the, something kind of piggybacking on both what Frank had mentioned and Matthew had mentioned you know, my concerns really, I'm a psychologist. I'm an educational psychologist. I'm uh, I'm co-chair of AI ethics education with IEEE. I'm working on emulated empathy standards for IEEE. Um, my big concern, one of my biggest concerns, I, I mean, I was speaking, I was in WEF, at WEF, I was speaking there, it is really the, the lack of not just social science, I mean, social sciences, yes, but of the lack of actual social practice, social science practitioners, practitioners, mental wellness practitioners in this field, because what, as people were mentioning, as Frank was mentioning, I mean, we know Silicon Valley has already just declared a state of emergency on loneliness, and that's a reflection of Murphy, uh, Murphy's uh, report on the national report on loneliness that is happening at the moment. Uh, mental health, the mental health repercussions. I mean, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm in on AI. I think it's fantastic stuff. I think it's the future. I think well, it's the present, it's the future. Simultaneously, I also work with large groups of young people. I've worked in over 500 schools throughout New York City. It's the largest school system in the country. And I will tell you the mental health crisis here is huge. And it's not just the young people. It's the teachers, it's everyone. And to Frank's point before about how people are getting educated, how do they even discern what is possible information? How do I know if this is real information? And it's not just elderly, mm -hmm. right? It's not just the elderly. This is, I'm right now I'm working on a digital alliance with UNESCO and UN and IEEE and a bunch of organizations on putting together a digital literacy. We're gonna call it something else because people, adult, People with skills don't want to be told that they're not literate, uh, just FYI. Um, so, <laughs> you know, we're working on that. How do we bring up not just AI skill, I mean, not just digital skills, but the difference is in what AI skills, what, I mean, I went, I have to say for any of you who are in DeVos, if you were not, I mean, if I heard one more people, person talk about how they were an AI expert or an AI evangelist or a, you know, the, uh, co 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 quantum computing was the same as AI, was the same as Gen AI, was the same as general intelligence. I mean, there's just the, there's a, it's it's a glut of information and it's not, it's not ill meaning. It's people, I, people are in a state of overwhelm. So I think those are, I mean, kind of, I'm kind of feel like I may be rambling here, but for me, this is really the issue. I'm, I was supposed to be speaking at MIT for Imagination and Action, but I'm speaking actually in Microsoft instead next month. Um, I figure speak uh, speak to the power grid there uh, is what I would do. But um, you know, I'm but I'm really am I'm concerned about the humans, right? We've got humans programming machines for humans by humans with humans, and um, I'm that's really my biggest concern is how do we right? And it's a we, because there's no saviors here. How do we begin to think about it? One of the interesting things, and I'll close with this, one of the very interesting things is I had several conversations with um, 
uh, people, indigenous populations in world at World Economic Forum. Very few, of course, there, but there were uh, contingency contingents there um, who were speaking about the fact that you know we don't have the infrastructure for the for the internet. We don't have the infrastructure, right? Because all the talk about democratizing, we don't have the infrastructure, and uh, honestly, we don't think we want it. Yeah. We're see we're seeing what it is doing to your children. We're seeing what it is doing to your people. And we're not sure we really want that here. It's a little bit like, are you bringing, we're not quite sure if you're bringing in small plot pox, right? So, and I and I don't want to call it that because I, there are so many benefits. We know there are so many benefits and it would be ex that, that are extraordinary, but also that can be a colonized way of thinking. And I really want to avoid that. Um, so I just, um, that my, my involvement when I come in, I'm very grateful. I read all of that you all uh, share because it's extra, what an extraordinary brain trust you're all giving and sharing. Um, and I just come when I can, but that's really my, my, my concern is the humans, <laughs> you know, yeah, is well, that, that that's built into the name people centered internet, um, is, is why we're here, Marisa. And well, I, I pronounced and it, your name the right way. The second you time. did, you <laughs> did. And it's, and it's also living beings, right? Because it's sure. also, you know, how, I don't know how good humans are doing with the planet. So, uh, you know, I'll include, I'll include our living beings. Anyway, I'll, I'll end it with that. But thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, We're delighted you're, you're, you are with us today. Mike Nelson, jump in. Thank you, Kevin. I, I want to build on a couple of things Marisa said and then ask a question of the entire group. Uh, but first, I want to say that I've been doing Internet policy and computer technology issues and data policy for 35 years. So by definition, I am now an AI expert and can go to Davos and talk about it just like everyone else. That is a joke. Um, one of what I'm one, one project I'm working on now, though, is dispelling all the AI myths that are circulating and adversely affecting our policy making and our corporate strategies. But to, to build on what Marisa said, I, I, I see a lot about uh, alone together. And some of that is people going online and chatting and playing games. They have a human connection. They have one tenth of a connection. The part of it all was the way we were and uh, I think the internet and social media particularly is bloody for a lot of problems that have more to do with. Mike, you're going into now. Oh, sorry. Well, let me just ask the point. The, the point I was going to make was that we do have a lot of. Um, I'll turn. I'll. I'll. I'll, um, I'll get rid of the video and see if that helps. But the point I was making is that um, we need to do more to make sure our kids in particular and our young adults are actually building the connection we need because there are going to be more things like the coronavirus heaven forbid we have a dirty bomb launched by north korea but there are going to be some cases where we really need communities to be much more resilient we we tend to talk about the resilience of our digital infrastructure and think we can blame the engineers or tell them to do the right thing and fix out all our problems but the truth is we need to have social structures. We need to focus on the people. And some of that will require better technology. Um, Kevin knows that I've run a salon for a couple of years online called Net4 Neighbors, the, the number. And we were exploring how the internet could be better at fostering local communities. But my question for the group uh, has to do with a study I read 15 years ago. It was written by a Russian um, political scientist named Orlov, who had left Russia, and he did a resilience comparison between the U.S. and Russia, and his conclusion was pretty stunning, that even though Russia had a lot less resources, if, some, if things really hit the Russians had more ways to make a go of it. They had backup systems. Most of them have a dacha so that they could leave the city and go vegetables if the supply chains broke down or there was a major volcano eruption and they didn't have much of a summer. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that they have that we don't have, but the most important thing they have that we don't have is really strong distributed family structures, which are then tied to friend structures. And we're losing that partly because of our busy, busy lives and our overscheduling and our 
our social media. So my question for the group, has anyone seen anything like the Orloff study for country after country, a, a sense of social resilience, a, a rigorous analysis that says, okay, we know social structures in Brazil are different than the ones in Canada, and the Brazilians have a better chance of going through our next global catastrophe. Mike, I would recommend that I connect you to uh, Richard Carson. Uh, Dr. Carson is an environmental economist at the University of California, San Diego, and is the chief scientist for Choice Flows. He probably has- Is that Carson or Parson? Was, what, C, what's the first letter? C is in Charlie, A-R-S-O-N. Okay. And so he was the uh, go-to person for the U.S. government to try to quantify uh, damage that was done by the Exxon Valdez and Deepwater Horizon oil spills. Um, so he's a large systems economist uh, mm -hmm. and has access to a lot of the typology of data that you're looking for, or at least know the researcher that probably is uh, best, you know, uh, or most written uh, in the uh, mm -hmm. space. You know, his his yeah, Google it's hard to do rigorous is, studies. <laughs> yeah, his Google Eight score right now is sitting at like uh, uh, sixty-eight, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Um, anyway, um, his, his Marisa, first name, his first name again was. No, no, uh, no what my, was what was Carson? Repeat, Mike, and then I'm going to go to Marisa. What's what your was Car what, what Carson's first? What was Doctor Carson's first name? Richard R I C H A R D. Richard, okay. You'll just sit, send me a Got quick it. Sorry, call sorry for the bad connection. I can connect you very easily. Uh, Mike, just letting you know, I can. I, I, I put. If you put your contact in, um, I have connections to regenerative design communities that include indigenous scholars, uh, which is really what you're you would be looking for because you're looking for some of the research that came out of Gaia Institute. Uh, and those kinds of things. And some of that work has been continued quite extensively. Uh, so if you put your contact in, I'm, I'd be happy to connect you with those. There it is. So um, Mike is with the Carnegie Endowment uh, Institute for Peace. So outstanding. Yeah. Um, and uh, Mike, I, I know your connectivity was uh, beginning to flag there, you know, toward the end. Thank you for, for joining us and, and being with us today. Yeah, going back to availability of the internet, right? Yes, Doug. You, you know, that's the, the challenge. You know, and I think of, uh, you know, redundancy and, you know, how to have, you know, like systems in place. Like in Africa, what they do is they have caching of, of, of the inter parts of the internet. Um, so you don't have to have connectivity to the actual mm -hmm. internet. You can have local uh, caching in place as well. Um, you know, so that's one thing, you know, and, you know, the question is, is do you design uh, resiliency in place, realizing that there's going to be failures, right? Um, so that's why you have redundancy. And these, this is the challenge is, is our society keeps getting more and more complicated. You know, how do we design a, a system uh, that, that balances, uh, you know, efficiency, costs, um, availability, and, you know, you know, you say, hey, I, I don't care about availability until you lose it, right? <laughs> you know, so, you know, and the question is, is when does things fail? And, uh, you know, so as a society, we have to think about these things. And, and then at a personal level, how do you handle resiliency, right? Uh, you, know, right. The, you know, you have these people who go off and live in bunkers, um, you know, and go off, learn how to live off the grid. I mean, that's one way of having resiliency, but we can't have a, if everyone does that, our society breaks down as well. So um, these are the challenges we have. Yeah, I mean, I work with people who are in different parts of the world who um, periodically lose power, right? Um, periodically yeah. lose, you know, connectivity. And so they have to actually plan their day differently than we do with the assumptions that we have that you know the power's on and that the uh, that we're going to be you know connected most of the time uh, you know so 
in, in those instances, having a notebook computer is not a, you know, uh, that's the only choice because when the power is on, you want to recharge the battery so you can keep working when power goes off, right? Um, or you, you've got some kind of a big universal power supply, you know, that's driving, you know, your, you know, your, your office or your, you know, workplace, or in the cases of, you know, folks that, you know, we work with in India, um, that there's a generator, you know, that they're, you know, they're working off of a generator half the time because the, you know, the grid isn't, isn't there. And then they have mesh networks where they can get to, uh, you know, piggyback over to a Wi-Fi router that's actually working a couple of blocks away, um, you know, when, you know, the main system isn't available in the neighborhood. I mean, it's really interesting the workarounds that are, you know, people are, you know, creating. Yeah, and, and from a CO2 gas emissions. Do you find that, that that workaround actually, in some respects, makes them better, more resilient than some of our systems here? Well, they're they just having to put more thought into what happens if, because it happens so much more often, Lynn. Uh, so I, I don't know whether it's better or worse. Um, but if you, you know, if you think about it, you know, what is the uh, phrase, you know, that necessity is the mother of invention, right? Is that the necessities are driving people to be more creative about how to, you know, keep, keep working in, in ways you know, that if you're part of a connected economy, when you're not connected, when you're out of power and you don't have these workarounds, you're not getting paid, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that they want to find ways you know, to you know, keep going that, that's but from, into the thought. Yeah, but from a CO2 gas emissions, I, I, I probably need to look up the statistics, but I would guess that there's a lot more a carbon footprint that your, your generator causes than, a, you know. Even well, a I mean, all you got to do is look at, you know, a place like Mumbai. Yeah. And you can cut the air with a knife. I, I, exactly. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's really... Um, you know, you know the the outcomes are not good for what right. I'm right, and and the driving. cost of energy um, and per kilowatt hour with a, a gas generator, I got to believe it's you know um, a lot higher you know than than you know a, a grid that's resilient, right? And so this is again the trade offs, right? You know, like if you're if 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 our society doesn't have the proper amount of resiliency in it and efficiency in it then people do alternatives that are actually so much worse, but you know, the people can afford it. Right. And uh, this is a challenge, you know, so like if I absolutely had to have the internet, what I would do is, you know, I have my local internet and then I would go with star, you know, get a star link for a hundred dollars a month, you know? so it's like, okay, now I have two systems. So if one goes down, I, I still have my star link system. I have, I have three systems coming into this house. Yeah, I have two the cable right system. I have a AT&T fiber optic cable coming into the house and I've got, you know, now have, you know, 5G in a connection via, you know, a tower. So I'm triply redundant, you know, when I'm doing, like what I'm doing here is, you know, it's unlikely that you'll ever lose me as a host. You can't get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the thing is, is, you know, you, you have local outages, right. That in the city, you know, if you, uh, you know, the good news of solar systems is they're designed for at least eight hours of backup power. Um, but, uh, you know, the thing is, is if you want more redundancy, you'd get a Starlink system for a hundred dollars a month. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, that's the, um, we're going, cycling back to the beginning of the conversation is we said that there were some issues associated with, you know, some cables getting cut. And does that mean that we have, you, you have to be able to think about even those long, you know, connections being, you know, redundant in, in a number of different ways. Undersea cable, yes. Satellites, yes. All right. It's not either or, it's both and. Well, like in California, in terms of they they say have eight hour, eight days worth of food and water plus a tent, you know, um available because there's an earthquake, you know, you, you may be out of you may not have food available for eight days, right? At least. So um that's what they kind of recommend. You know, how many of us have have that available to us, right? If we lose power, if we lose the ability to go to the store. 
And we learned that a little bit. So I know that's going off the tangent of the internet, but you know, as you look at what, your, your basic needs, right? Food and water is a little bit more important than the internet when you don't have food and water. Well, we're talking about technology. You know, we proposed a study to the to FEMA, Federal Emer uh, Emergency Management, uh, you know, group that um, if that happened, if the um, you know that we actually had you know a major event on the West Coast that caused the need for migration to the inside of the United States by people, kind of the reverse of you know people leaving Oklahoma in the Dust Bowl for California, that California is needed to move inland, is would they actually find a welcoming population or would they be met with you know, a lot of resistance, right? And you know, so that's not you know, a technology statement, that is a cultural normative statement of you know, how, would, you know, how would those inland you know, uh, you know, states and so on and so forth you know, react to an influx of, you know, refugees from another state. We don't, we haven't studied, we don't know. We have some assumptions that say that, you know, it might not go well, all right, uh, in, in the hypothesis. All right, so Lynn Wells, I see that you have joined us. We're delighted. Uh, uh, more uh, thoughts, uh, anything triggering about uh, things that are, you know, that you're currently studying. You're going to be with us in a couple of weeks talking about, you know, Puerto Rico. Do you want to give us kind of a preview of what this discussion is uh, triggering in your mind? So the, um, so the Puerto Rico discussion, I'll tie this back to this in a minute, um, is interesting in that we started off with something called a tribal resource center which was intended to be a trusted source of information in the midst of the shark, you know, the shark filled feeding frenzy and jump filled waters over the amount of broadband money that was out there that tribe could go to, to understand, you know, what digital opportunities meant for them and their worlds, their resources and what when kind you of say tribe, just for everybody else's reference, we're talking about uh First Nation, you know, in North America? We are. West? We're okay. We, just, we, just want to make sure that we, that that's what you meant, okay? Worked with four tribes in the Northwest um, initially and subsequently expanded. Uh, it's actually reached eventually 190 tribes. In the <laughs> but so there was an online resource that had information about what grants were available, what the internet was, videos, how to splice a cable, how to set up a cell tower and so on, wheels, a cow, um, things like that. And then uh, there were a series of very intensive community engagement projects called boot camps, um, which were led by Matt Ratman and um, uh, a significant credibility in the Native American community. Um, and there were 10 of those done during the course of the project. Uh, and that reached, I think, about 500 people in those. And then uh, the, to maintain the momentum, uh, actually is now setting up a, a tribal um, academy, a broadband academy, uh, that will be run by a Native American entity as the people sent in that kind of phases out of that. So we're looking at taking that three, those three parts, the online resource, the community engagement, and the uh, academy to Puerto Rico in a proposal that we put forward. Don't know yet whether it's going to get accepted as a concept paper on, on developing a um, climate resilient workforce, climate, climate aware workforce. Um, and as I say, it's going off now to expand to more and more tribes. One of the things we've left out of it candidly, was a discussion of, much of the discussion about cyber security and cyber resilience. If you look. So much just getting the basics of, of uh, what the internet was, what could do for people. And so I would hope as we do the Puerto Rico work, if they have equally serious cyber security problems as the Native American communities do, that we will pay more attention to folding cyber security in from the beginning. Um, and the other piece, I just, I'm sorry I missed the beginning of it, but the whole issue about cyber resilience of the Internet of Things 
and cyber-physical systems is just a recurring concern of mine uh, in that you have to deal with two very different cultures, two very different technological change rates, two different uh, kinds of budgeting, and how you put together an organizational learning approach between all that. So I think those two things will be a key part of what we're looking at going forward, organizational learning for cyber-physical systems and developing the TRC model for other communities. Over. Okay. Thank you. I greatly appreciate you uh, sharing that and to some degree previewing what's going to happen in a couple of weeks with you and our uh, you know, fellow that was working on that, uh, Todd Hoskins, for, uh, for PCI. Uh, Marisa, thank you for all the uh, work that you put into chat. Greatly appreciate that. Um, so we, we were a relatively compact you know, group today. And I think that we've covered the topic. Let me just check. Uh, any thoughts that uh, were unexpressed uh, that you want to uh, share before we uh, conclude? Because I think uh, you know, our overtime uh, is probably not needed today. But if you have uh, thoughts, We'll, we'll go as, as long as uh, we have uh, energy and, and, and voice. So anyone have any? Yes, Frank, see your hand. Yeah, I'd like to briefly just mention that uh, local bulletin board systems proliferated in the decade prior to public access to the internet. And there's a local global dynamic and we're all very familiar with the global, but locally can be people that you trust and it could be creating an environment that is free local access, but not available to just anyone on the internet. So it, it can be safer. And I believe in Houston, when there were hurricanes, they set up ad hoc wireless mesh systems that were not necessarily on the internet, but were designed for local emergency uh, communications. And much of my early work was trying to get rural communities excited about the potential of we're better together if we learn how to support each other with asynchronous communications. And uh, I think there's a, a role for a, a sub internet that's local that is safer than what the general global internet now offers. And I just want to you know, kind of make the comment that the same tools that we use globally can be very, very effective locally, but that never really caught fire. There was an early community networking movement with BBSs that was before most people had PCs or any real digital literacy. And then when the internet got going, ISOC in particular, they have community networking center and resources, but it's all infrastructure. It's not the more social side that I think Lynn was uh, referring to. And so uh, in Africa and in Alaska, where I've worked with villages, uh, there are ways where you can have a five terabyte hard drive thumb drive uh, delivered with the daily mail from the mail plane that could supplement uh, in uh, slow speeds with internet access by providing a daily updated chunk of the best resources that uh, people need for their very uh, specific needs. And uh, with, with indigenous tribes, if you just give all kids the internet and an iPhone, it's predictable what they'll use it for. And a lot of that can be negative and downright dangerous. And so I just wanted to to mention that I think there's untapped potential for emergency systems locally and for bringing people together more closely at the local level instead of everyone dealing with the global dynamic. So right. uh, that makes sense. That's uh, an area of my interest and uh, thank you. Yeah, Frank, I'll just uh, add that um, not for the data exchange that you're talking about, although you know that I, I've seen that modeled um, is that, uh, you know, Coca-Cola, you know, is the largest distribution network in Africa, um, across the continent. And so they have invented this fake can 
okay, that's actually a container that as they make their rounds, instead of, you know, putting into the, um, you know, uh, you know, carriers, they have this fake, and it has medicine in it, all right? So they're the medicine distribution network, right? Uh, you know, they do this because they're, you know, they're trying to, you know, promote, you know, goodwill for the, for the company. But, you know, it would very easily you know, be imagined that you could do the same thing for, you know, uh, hard stored information. And indeed, um, exactly what you're describing is how information is moved from point A to point B if you're in a SCIF environment. So you know, we, we know how to do it. Now, there's no question that we still know how to isolate and move information from point A to point B in, in ways. Uh, but you're talking about doing it not for the reason of security. You're talking about doing it you know, for an you know, alternate distribution. I and I want to yes, just add, Mar Marisa, yes. I wanted to add one thing because Frank, one of the things I'm hearing from what you're saying is it's also this is who it's about trust. Hmm. Right. This is it comes down to human trust because deep in from because of deep fakes, because of the because people are paralyzed by first of all, they're paralyzed by all the information. Second of all, they're distrustful of people from the outside, whoever the is on the outside. Right, so th this it also has to do with how do we begin to embed trust, and trust and and methods and approaches for trust within a system that is so deeply <laughs> challenging. I'll call it challenging. I, I'm an optimist, um, but I think but one of the I think that's really what I was hearing is it's really a, this is about this is about how do we foster and grow trust within within the system and between systems. With an epidemic of global loneliness as the result of social media, yeah, something's gone sideways. And it is indeed about trust, friendship, and helping your neighbor. Right. Uh, I was born in Cody, Wyoming in 52. I remember yeah. everybody being pleasant and eager to help one another. Yeah, now I, we have Trumpers and hate and racism, and yeah. that's not right. And people say they can believe whatever they want to believe and they tend toward the negative, you know, that's the outcome of how social media has been abused by people knowingly mis 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 misappropriating algorithms. So how do we get back to good old rural and remote and indigenous trust and love and supporting your local neighbors is uh, an open question. So thanks for your comments. I'm looking forward to connecting with you, Frank. I've got uh, IEEE, we're working on a project at, for Miami for climate about actually having people within the community communicate with each other. So I, I will reach out to you. I have a we I have a feeling we have a lot of synergies there. Anyway, yes, thank you. That's been an area of interest as well. The regeneration folks in Australia in particular. Yeah, one comment I would have is the internet, you know, has the ability where I can connect it with anyone. And, uh, you know, if used properly, you know, this is a very powerful tool, you can connect, like with, right now, you know, we're, you know, I haven't met any of you in person. And yet, you know, we're having a connection, a meaningful connection, a value, in my opinion, I'm having a valuable connection. And, uh, you know, so there's, there's can be uh, with any powerful tool, there's can be great good but then there's great harm and even social media, you know, Facebook, when they, you know, they get dinged for the harm they're doing to some teenagers. Um, but if you look at the study, there's just as much positive effect that teenagers find that, that, that improves their life. So uh, there's as much positive to some, you know, there's p positive on some people and a big negative to others. And so the question is like, how do we use each two, how do we teach people to use tools pro properly so that they can use these tools um, to do great good and not great harm. It is about trust. Yeah. And friendship, as May Lin says. Yeah. yeah. And local. I do totally agree. You need to be hyper global, but at the same time, you need to be hyper local. And if you're not connecting with people in your local community, um, that's a problem as well. Yeah. I would also add the word authenticity right into yeah. the mix because you know the you know the, the laddering up back up to trust comes with authenticity as the middle, you know, attribute. Yeah, the, the word of the year from the Cambridge Dictionary last year was hallucinate, 
you know, and where AI is making up things, you know, humans make up things, politicians make up things, marketing people make up things, news reporters make up things, right? To, you know, they, you know, there's all this, um, you know, hallucination going on, making up things and manipulating things. But, uh, but the uh, Webster's word of the year was authentic, right? And how do we have authentic relationships? How do we have authentic information? How do we make sure that what we're saying is authentic? And, uh, and Frank, to your point, I believe local, um, you know, when you're when you're with people locally, you tend to be more authentic than when you, you're, uh, you know, just anonymous on the Internet. Yeah, I have a I'm not going to say the word because you guys know how I feel about, you know, language on this, because I like to think that our library would be able to be used by teachers and you know, others as an educational resource. But um, I'll just say that uh, this Harry Frankfurt wrote this book. It's only sixty-seven pages long. Uh, that's, uh, the full uh, the the contraction is BS. Okay, you know the longer word. Uh, and he's saying it's not about truth or falsity. It's that we you know spend a lot of time in this middle realm of you know people who are really good at creating you know an alternative, which is BS. Right yeah. and you know, that you have to have a good detector, you know, for navigating the world. And unfortunately, so much of, of I, I don't think we have a lot of that here in this community. Thank you very much. All right. But the, the fact is, um, uh, we do have to uh, do a lot of filtering. So with that, all right, we have had a great conversation today. Thank you for joining. Everything you do, be intentional. And we'll talk in two weeks. Cheers. Good job.